afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. All right. I trust everybody had a good um, morning so far. Amen. And now we are going to go into our camp book discussion. Now we are looking at a very important um, presentation here on the divine human marriage, a great mystery. Yeah. Part one, the primary union. Now you'll see how much ground we can cover in this presentation. At this time, I invite you to bow your heads with me. Welcome one, welcome all. The I can't even see uh, the people who are on it. All right, but no problem. Let us pray. Oh, beautiful. All right, thank you very much. Um, Welcome to Sister Sharon Atwell, the prices. Sister Carrion, I would have met you in Florida, Ryan, and Sister Angelina Chaudhry, our latest um, baptized member, Carrion, Ryan, and Evangelina, Sister Ricardo. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God, gracious God and Father, be with us in this session. Give us the guidance of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're looking at the first two dimensions of the primary union. First two dimensions in this divine human marriage, which is one of the understandings that are very, very unique in Reformation, a divine human marriage. So right in Ephesians chapter, so we're gonna start get the ball rolling. We're still fiddling with this. Uh, I just want something to be able to carry it up and bring it down. <laughs> I ain't got it. But you got to go down to page 31. We are beginning at page 30. Right. All right, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, we are told that the marriage between Christ and his church is called a great mystery. Can anyone tell me why is it, it is a mystery? It says, even though the Apostle Paul compares it with human marriage, it is still called a mystery in order to enable us to get at least a beginner's insight into the mystery. Why is it a mystery? Why is it called a great mystery? Anybody there? Not too sure. Okay. It is not called a mystery because God has chosen to keep it from us. It is called a great mystery. It's just that our minds cannot fathom how much is involved in this marriage between Christ and the church. But we have been given a little illustration in the idea of human marriage. And in human marriage, we are told that the two becomes one. Some people ask, which one? But the truth is, it's not which one. It is a one that is a unity, a oneness, as it were. And even though there is plural, two individuals, yet they are called one. God is a plural, a majestic plural, and yet he is one God. Yet there are three persons that make up that one Godhead. 
So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, we are told that marriage between Christ and the church is a great mystery, meaning that we can't fathom it. And even though the Apostle Paul compares it with human marriage, in order to enable us to get at least a beginner's insight into the mystery. So, so deep is this mystery that even though we are merely, as it were, scratching the surface, we need to study it stage by stage and step by step. All right, you're going to ask someone to start reading that paragraph. There are four levels of union in spiritual marriage. There are four levels of union in spiritual marriage in the plan of redemption. One, the primary union between the divine nature and fallen human nature in the incarnate Son of God. Mm -hmm. Two, the secondary union between Christ and the individual believer. Three, the tertiary union between Christ and his church. And four, the quaternary union between Christ and his kingdom. So first, we must study the primary union. What, in your idea, having read, is the primary union? Between the divine nature and fallen human nature is the incarnate Son of God. Okay, thank you very much. It's the divine nature and fallen human nature in Jesus Christ, all two combined. God combined all two in Jesus Christ. Could they be separated after that union? No. No. Impossible. You cannot separate it. Christ united his divine nature with human nature, fallen human nature. And you could not be separated because Jesus Christ is one. So this primary union is critical and important, all right? Good morning. It is three-dimensional. Good morning. Good morning. Pardon? Good morning. So can we say then that that is an eternal marriage? If it is the... Can we say that it's an eternal marriage? Yes, you're correct. The union between Christ and human nature has been made an eternal marriage. Christ has united himself with humanity for how long? Forever. Never more to be separated. And I like to illustrate it like Christ condescending to take on human nature and will have human nature forever. He will remain a human with a human nature throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. He then bore it. The, the Bible does not teach for God so love us that he lent his only begotten son. He gave him to the human race for how long? Forever to become one with them. So that's an eternal union, Sister Gail. That's correct. An eternal union. That's what's sure the lengths to which God is willing to go in order to unite with fallen humanity. Very critical. That is the primary union, as it were. All right, sorry. But in Matthew 22, we are told about the parable of the marriage feast. And we will study that chapter later, but pay attention to two foundational facts in this parable found in Christ's Object Lesson. Christ's Object Lesson 307, paragraph 1. By the marriage is represented what? The union of humanity with divinity. God has gone that lane and he will never come back again. Christ will remain forever with us, human nature, as our elder brother. He was the only begotten son of God, but now he has become our elder brother. So that we are now begotten sons of God the Son. He was the only begotten. Christ is no longer the only begotten. We, as a result of this union, become begotten sons of God the Son. So we are one. And God now has other begotten sons and daughters through his son, Jesus Christ. How do we know that? We are told that at the baptism, when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, 
that that statement was not only directed to his son, but for all those who shall become one in Jesus Christ. They too become begotten sons of God. And God loves us as dearly as he loves his son. What a love. So body marriage is represented the union of humanity with divinity. The wedding garment represents the character which all must possess who have a, who shall be accounted fit guests for the wedding. Now we come to the incarnation. All right. Somebody start reading. At least um, that section. The incarnation is the term used for the Son of God becoming flesh. It is incomprehensible. It is an incomprehensible mystery. John 1, 1 to 3 and verse 14. That God should thus be manifested in the flesh is indeed a mystery. And without the help of the Holy Spirit, we cannot hope to comprehend this subject. The most humbling lesson that man has to learn is the nothing less of human wisdom and the folly of trying by his own unaided efforts to find out God. 1SM 249.1. Praise the Lord. Well read. Um, that is clearly um, telling us that this thing about God becoming manifest in the flesh is a great mystery. And that's also found in 1 Timothy chapter um, 3, verse 16. The, the mystery of godliness that Christ became a man was preached into the world, worshipped by angels, and received up into glory. That is known as the mystery of godliness. What is the contrast to that mystery of godliness? We have the mystery of Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. What is the mystery of the opposite to that mystery? I'm just trying to get your uh, encouragement and thinking there. Will be that will that not be sin? Sin or the mystery of True. iniquity. Iniquity, yes. Mystery of iniquity. See, all those two mysteries contrasted. The mystery of godliness with the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness is Christ manifests in the flesh. What is the mystery of godliness? The mystery of iniquity? The antichrist. And the principle, two principles are not the same at all. And the most humbling lesson we are told is for man to learn his nothingness. The nothingness of human wisdom. Yesterday, I made a point in the class that when it comes to the church of God, and I'm sure you discussed it yesterday, you have the church of God in heaven, united with the church of God on earth. And the truth is, that is a mystery too. And we cannot fathom. So we cannot say that X and Y are part of that church. We go by faith based on their profession. But in terms of the comprising the composition of the church of God. Each one of us in our hearts must know our standing, our faithfulness, and our commitment because we are told from the beginning the true church of God has been comprised of faithful souls. And who only knows those faithful souls? Only God. Very important. And yesterday we even discussed about Seeking to you bring about unity in the church. That's not our effort. We can't get that due. But God can get it done by his spirit. As he works upon heart, he can unite people together. All right. First dimension of the primary and the second. Somebody go ahead. The first dimension of the primary union. By taking upon himself our corporate fallen human flesh, he became one flesh with us. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18, Romans 1 and 3, and Romans 8 and 3. The second dimension of the primary union. His purpose in becoming one flesh with fallen humanity was to make fallen humanity one spirit with him. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. 
we have we have so so far studied the two basic dimensions in the primary union between the divine nature and fallen human nature and the incarnate son of God. The third dimension will be an amazing step. Div divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined and man and God became one. It is this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. Looking upon Christ in humanity, we look upon God and see him in the brightness of his glory, this the express image of his person. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparably one, and yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become a man, the Godhead was still his own. <coughs> Sorry. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. All right, praise the Lord. That very important that we understand um, that principle. Um, the blending of the human and the divine became one. A one that could no longer be separated into two again. Now, you know, if you take sugar and put it in water and stir it up, you get sweet water. But can you separate the sugar from the water? No. <laughs> Those who do chemistry would know. If you put salt in water and stir it up and have salt water, can you separate the salt from the water? No. Well, in chemistry, you learn with through a crystal glass, you can heat the water and you can separate the salt from the water. In Barbados, we have a whole plant that does that, call it desalination plant. And I am one of the people who is privileged to receive that, that um, desalinated water. They wish they take out the salt from the water. They crystallize, the salt it crystallizes um, out of the water so that you can get just water and also salt. So you can separate salt from water, so from salty water, salt from the water, and you can separate the sugar from the water. And we get we do that in Barbados. We have a whole plant that separates the liquid from the solid at the cane factory. We separate the salt and sugar from the, the other part of the liquid. So you crystallize the sugar and you have the sugar crystal, dark brown sugar, and you have liquid as it were. The liquid may be uh, a different composition than the sugar. So you can separate sugar from water and salt from water, but that union that is in Christ, you cannot separate it. It is like trying to separate the mule, uh, the donkey, from the horse in a mule. Now, a mule is a combination of a horse and a donkey. It's a unique breed. Mules do not reproduce. So a horse can reproduce and a donkey can reproduce. But when you get a horse and a donkey together, you get a mule that cannot be reproduced. I hope that illustration brings it out. So you cannot separate the donkey from the horse. So when Christ united together himself in, with divinity, with humanity, he, no, he was no longer divine, had a divine nature this time. It was no longer human nature. What was it? It was no longer his divine nature. It was no longer a human nature. It was now a a divine human nature. A one now that can no longer be divided into two. All right, so we are told that divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined. And by the way, it is said that that is where we find the hope of our fallen race. Because it is in that union that Christ chose not 
to sin. Could he have sinned? Yes. Of course, he but could he have sinned. Tempted. Now, some people don't think that he could have sinned. But why is it that he could have sinned? Because, because he, he had the human had aspect. aspect. Because he had the human aspect. And humanity tempted can give in to sin. But could the divinity have sinned? No. Definitely not. So the human nature could have sinned because Christ was divine and human and therefore he could be tempted just like how we are tempted and could have sinned. And that is why Spirit of Prophecy mentioned it is in this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. Not just in the union, but in the fact that he remained faithful in that union. He blended that union in one. Very important. I have a so thought here. Look at, pardon? I have a thought here. I have a thought. Okay. So here we're looking at Christ who had both a divine and a human nature. And it's very interesting because um, we know that um, Satan um, pretty much knew the prophecies and pretty much knew what was about to take place. And basically here today, and we can go back um, in times past to see how we have like the amalgamation of creatures. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So it's amazing. That, so to me, it's amazing that here it is. We see Christ being having this divine and human nature. But here on planet Earth, we have the amalgamation of various creatures. Even in our crops today, we have the GMO modification. Yes. Yeah, hybrid. So, Yes, the hybrid. So here we see um, we have hybrids going on today, but Christ was the first who who um, who did this. But I think in one of her, in, I think it's in early writings, even before Christ came on earth, I think it was, I, I'm not sure if it is um, before the flood or after the flood, but I think it was before the flood when she talked about the amalgamation of creatures. Yeah. Yeah. They're just pretty interesting, you know, <laughs> how the enemy yeah, tried to very, capitalize very, very on certain things. Yes. Um, I kind of hasn't reached that technology kind of that, that technology yet. Their their technology technological understanding include hybridization and their created species that we can't create today. They went to build a tower all up in the skies going through the clouds. That should tell you a lot. All right. So uh, we are told that Christ had that divine glory in him, but he veiled it. And we are told that the, the human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. They were closely and inseparably one. Yet it had a distinct individuality. That's called the person Jesus Christ. So the person Jesus Christ could die because he had a human nature. But divinity cannot die. But as a person, Jesus Christ died. That is, he ceased to function for three and a half, three days, three nights, as it yes, were. So that's what went. So that's what went to. Um, that's what went to the grave. Yes, the yes. human nature went to the grave, but not the person. The no. person was resurrected, but all mm -hmm. of the human nature, fallen human nature, went to the grave. And when Christ ascended, he took on a new nature, the divine human nature, which was filled out with the, the divine human nature. The body was filled out with the divine human nature. You know, that's a very deep thought. A that's creature. a very deep thought there. That's a very yeah. deep thought there in the aspect of the human nature had to die for for now the for now it to be risen now in this new nature of divinity and humanity that is a very deep thought there something to think about you know oh yeah in the oh, aspect yeah. of that as, that that had to die because the wage of sin is death so therefore that human aspect had to die had to face death but yeah. yet, because he is divine, because he is God, <laughs> you mentioned there that um, 
the personhood did not die. Can you repeat in reference to the personhood? Um, uh, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I said that the human nature was so blended with the divine nature that if the human nature had sinned, that we're going a little for deeper there. If the human nature had sinned, the person, Jesus Christ, would have been destroyed. So as a person, Jesus died because he did not sin. And even though he, human nature died, everything about the human nature went to the grave. But he came up in the resurrection with a new body, yet the same form and features of the old body, but a different composition altogether. For the prophecy mentions that composition in First Corinthians chapter 15. The, her comment on first that is that the nature that Christ brought forth from the grave was of a finer material, but it was the divine nature that was in his mind and upon his resurrection of the body, the divine nature filled out the human nature. So you have the new per man, Christ Jesus. And as we will learn, a new species in the universe of God. The Bible calls it a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So the newest creation that we have had since Adam is Jesus Christ. Amen. And that was a blending of a divine human nature and the human nature with the divine nature. And that is why Jesus started that ball rolling. And he is the father of this new divine human species in the universe. Do you know that the Bible calls them men wonder that? So when the redeemed are traveling with Jesus Christ, visiting all the other worlds, the other worlds will point at them. As they pass by, men wonder that, and it is true then, the Bible says, that God will use, God, God will reveal the manifold wisdom of God. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 1. And eventually, church, through the church, will, reveal, will be revealed to principalities and powers in heavenly places, the manifold wisdom of God. So we will be used to teach the unfallen worlds about the manifold wisdom of God. What a thought. All right. So we are told that his Godhead was still his own. His deity could not die. It could not be lost. While he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. But the temptation, the fact that he was united humanity with divinity, fallen humanity, if Christ had chosen to sin, which the Spirit of Prophecy said he could have done. Some people deny it, but he could have done it. I, I always remember that Wagner gave a wonderful talk as a morning, and Ellen White was there present. And after coming down a wonderful line, he came to the conclusion, therefore Christ could not have sinned. And Ellen White picked up that the evening, to the nighttime. So he gave a pro talk in the nighttime. The morning time, when she came to the meeting, she said, well, the Wagner gave a wonderful presentation last night, but the conclusion was wrong. Can you imagine that? How the servant of the Lord picked up that error? He said, all that he said was true, but the conclusion was wrong. Christ could have sinned. He was a real man. His temptations were real. He could have sinned. Now, what was involved in that could have sinned? A lot. We are told that when Christ died, he ceased to function for three days. His, his, everything remained in the grave. The three days, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit and body ceased, uh, and soul ceased to function. Body went down to the grave. Didn't decompose yet because it, it, God didn't allow it to see corruption. But he came forth from the grave, a resurrected new creation which he offers to us as a gift. The next section deals with two natures in one person. 
Somebody else read that, please. Just a short section. Two natures, one person. The incarnate Son of God possessed two natures. He was fully God and fully human, yet the divine personality fused with the function, fused with, with and functioned only through the human personality, mm -hmm. so that he was and ever will remain one person. Mm -hmm. This mystery we accept by faith, though it is beyond our comprehension. Beautiful. True. Now, you would notice that above, there are some texts that shows the kind of nature that Jesus Christ came with. Of sinful, meaning having the effects of sin upon it, being sin damaged, sinful, fallen, weak, degenerate, mortal, human nature. And we teach that Christ came with that kind of nature and could have sinned but chose not to sin. He, he, he came with a fallen human nature. So the moment you take away that truth to give the impression that Christ came with a divine sinless human nature, you are teaching and introducing the mystery of iniquity. And that is why the nature of Christ's doctrine is so important to us. And White has a statement that says, the humanity of Christ means everything to us. It is the golden cord that connects us with God. And through Christ, we become one with him. So you can't throw away the humanity of Christ as he's having a sinful, fallen, weak, degenerate, mortal human nature. He had a nature that could die and did die. And he was mortal, that is. But he had a divinity, he had his divinity also blended with that human nature. So when people see that Christ did not come in the same kind of flesh and blood as we come in, that he was not really tempted like us, and that he could not have sinned, that is a completely different gospel altogether. Completely different gospel. And the thing about the 28 fundamental beliefs, apart from the 27, they had a 28 growth and grace. The 20, in the 27 from the 28 fundamental belief, they are saying that Christ had not the nature of Adam before the fall, nor the nature of Adam after the fall, but something in between, which is something that does not exist in God's universe at all. So people shy away from saying that Christ had a sinful, fallen human nature. But when we talk about sinful, fallen human nature, we are talking about human nature that was sin damaged. That is, it had the effects of sin upon it, but it was not sinning flesh. It was not sinning flesh, but it was sinful flesh. And that's why Romans chapter 1, as well as Romans chapter 8, verse 3, tells us that Christ came in the likeness, that is, the sameness of sinful man. Same kind of human, and that's why Hebrews 4 is mentioned, that 14 to 18 is mentioned in there. Or verily, he took on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of man, fallen man. He also himself likewise took part of the same. And that is why the nature of Christ's doctrine is one of our unique, distinctive, present truths. Not everybody holds it in Adventism. But there are some who hold the correct view. All right. I, I think I told you the story of um, Pastor Stephen Bohr, who was invited to give a talk in Medellin, Medellin, Colombia, on the nature of Christ. And what the people did not ask him was, what is his position? So when he presented his position, clearly people were forced to admit, well, Pastor Bohr gave a wonderful presentation. As a matter of fact, one person said, Pastor Bohr gave a wonderful presentation, but I'm just sorry that nobody will here to present the other side. Now, what's the other side to truth? The only yeah. other side yeah. to truth is error. Yet they admit that the presentation he gave concerning Christ taking our sinful fallen human nature was true. 
if it is true, then throw away the next view. The next view is false. But you know what he said? The leader of the biblical research institute said the Adventists accept plurality of beliefs in the nature of Christ. So all two are accepted within Adventism. And clearly, one belongs to the Roman power, Roman Catholic Church, and the other one belongs to present truth. So when you check Jones and Wagner and all those reformers back then, they held the correct view on the nature of Jesus Christ until it was changed in the 1930s, 40s. When Bible readings for the home, somebody was commissioned to expunge the correct understanding of the nature of Christ, that Christ had a sinful fall in human nature. So ever since then till now, that controversy has been an Adventist hot potato. All right? Uh, the last section, oh, time flew as well. Can somebody read that last section? Two fundamental purposes of the incarnation, and then we we'll close. Okay. Page 33. Two fundamental purposes of the incarnation or primary divine human union. Firstly, to break Satan's deceptive power by the full revelation of God's character of agape love through our human nature, which the Son of God took on, in order that a world darkened through misapprehension of God might be brought back to God, not by force, but by the demonstration of God's incomprehensive love. John 1, 14 to 18, John 8, 12, and also see uh, Desire of Ages, page 22. The incarnate Son of God in his suffering and death for our human guilt fully reveal God's agape love. Secondly, to redeem humanity by submitting our human nature, which he took on, to the will of God, of God, straight through to the agonies of suffering, the separation from the Father, thereby perfecting human character, in fact, thereby creating a, a human character as a victorious reflection of the divine character. In taking upon himself our human will and nature and submitting both to the will of God, the man Christ Jesus, as our substitute and surety, had to learn obedience by the things he suffered in order to make fallen humanity one in spirit with him. Mm -hmm. One? Okay. Go on, yeah. Okay. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and, te and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered, Hebrews 5, 7 to 9. A.T. Jones put it beautifully in lecture 11 of his 1895 lectures when he wrote, commenting on Ephesians 2, 15. God makes one new man out of God and a man, and in Christ, God and man met so they can be one. So, I just in, okay, go ahead. Justice demands that sins be not merely pardoned, but the death penalty must be executed. God, in the gift of his only begotten Son, met both these requirements. By dying in man's stead, Christ exhausted the penalty and provided a pardon. Man through sin has, severed, has severed from the life of God. His soul is pulsed pulse through the mach What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. imaginations of Satan, the author of sin. Of himself, he is incapable of sensing sin, incapable of appreciating and appropriating the divine nature. Were it brought within his reach, there is nothing in it that his nature, his natural heart would desire it. The bewitching power of Satan is upon him. All the igneous sub, subterfuges mm -hmm. that, that the devil can suggest are presented to his mind to prevent every good impulse. Every fact, 
actually every fact <laughs> sorry what is that word actually and power given him of god has been used as a weapon against the divine benefactor so although he loves him god cannot safely impart to him the gifts and blessings he desires to bestow but god will not be defeated by satan he sent his son into the world that through his taking the human form and nature humanity and the Divinity combined in him would elevate man in the scale of more value with God. Where is he lying? See, let me mention but 1, 3, 40. Now, there's a lot in there. We are told that the mind that Christ now has is what kind of mind? It is not a divine mind. It is not a human mind. What kind of mind is it? A oh, divine so. human yeah. mind. mind. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, a divine human mind. And it was through that divine human mind that God in Christ developed the faith of Jesus. So when we talk about the faith of Jesus, by the way, we are talking about the faith that was developed from his birth right through until his death. That's the divine human mind that developed the faith of Jesus. Now, I've been, I, I've had to do a little research on the faith of Jesus, but wherever I turn, I could find no information from the internet nor any Adventist book. When I read the Adventist books and the title of the faith of Jesus, all I see is the doctrines of the Adventist church. You know, I tell you, I go through the conference, I go through the, the, the ABC and look for books on the faith of Jesus. And when you look at the topic and you look at the, 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 the contents, all you are seeing is the doctrines of the Sunday Adventist Church. Nobody True. itemizes it as distinct from faith in Jesus. That is the faith of Jesus as distinct from the faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus was that faith that you fully develop while here on this earth. It is a mature, progressive, developmental faith that has conquered sin and that, that overcame the temptations of Satan that were beyond the limits of human endurance. And that is why this statement says, but God will not be defeated by Satan. He sent his son into the world that through his taking the human form and nature, humanity and divinity combined in him would elevate man in the scale of moral worth, value with God. So when God is finished with humanity, where will humanity be seated? On his throne. On the throne of God. Jesus said, something? Revelation 20. 321 to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne now is that a position granted to the angels would angels ever be seated on God Christ's throne no no never and yet the angels are working feverishly to get us to a position to sit on the throne, a position that they can never and will never occupy. Just think about that. You see how unselfish the angels are? They are working hard to get us to sit on the throne of Christ, a position that they can never and will never occupy. And the reason for that is only man was made in the image and likeness of God with the potential to develop and to uh, develop a mind that could be infused with the mind of God and could be elevated to the throne of God so that we become one of God's divine family, a divine human family, one with the family, divine family of heaven. So we will be part of God's 
the Godhead, as it were, in Christ. It was always God's plan to have a creature on the throne. And in Christ, God accomplished that eternal purpose. That's what the next chapter deals with. Um, no, no, it leaves with later on, sorry. Or right, we'll stop there. When we come back, we'll deal with the important point and then move on to the next chapter. Thank you for your participation. I trust you have been blessed and that God's Spirit will continue to teach you and teach us as we prepare for the final events. Let us pray. Does someone pray for us, please? Eternal Father, we want to thank thee for this opportunity to sit at your feet and learn even more of you and to get clarity and understanding of that divine human nature. Amen. Father God, you, the Father, and your Son gave up everything to heal us, to heal humanity. And all we can say is thank you. Yet we do not understand many things, but with you, all things, all things we know are possible. So we want to thank thee for this book that you blessed um, Dr. Douglin to write. We want to thank thee for this camp meeting wherein we can now come and study even more deeper. And we pray, Father God, that indeed our hearts may be blessed tremendously. And as we continue to sit and learn, may you Grant unto us like Daniel, skill, wisdom, and understanding of all these things. So we thank you now. We pray for the lunch that we provided for those who are there. And may you continue to help that as we as the people uplift you in every aspect of our lives. But most of all, may you draw us even closer to you and to each other. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We will meet back tonight for the online session. God bless you. Have a good lunch of bread.